I, I will talk about artificial intelligence today, uh, but most people these days think that artificial intelligence is, is machine learning. And machine learning is really good, uh, for example, for pattern recognition, knowing that if you have an image, what's actually on that image, like the uh, it's a dog on the image, right? If it's an image of a dog, or when you have uh, a piece of uh, a, a, a bit of voice and you know that uh, what um, what they're actually saying in that in that voice recording, right? Uh, but that's pattern recognition, and uh, human beings are pretty good at pattern recognition. Um, I'll be talking about something completely different today. I'll talk about artificial intelligence for planning optimization. And humans are pretty bad at planning optimization. And I'll show you today how with um, intelligent algorithms, uh, like and projects like for example, uh, and uh, like for example, OptoPlanner, we can actually optimize that. Um, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to do some live coding on the Quarkus platform to actually make this happen, right? Um, so yes, I'm Jeffrey De Smith. Um, I, uh, I'm the lead of the OptoPlanner project. I'm not Hannibal J. Smith, but I do love it when a plan comes together. Right, so let's get started. Um, so um, this is the application that we'll build. And uh, basically we're going to assign uh, for the demo application today, we're going to assign uh, lessons such, such as English, chem chemistry, math, and so forth to time slots, as you, which you can see here on the side, like Monday morning, 8.30 to 9.30 and so forth to and to a number of rooms. So this is the application that we'll build. And what we're, what's going to happen is when we click this green button over here, the solve button, then uh, OptoPlanner and Quarkus will make sure that these lessons actually get filled into these rooms and into these time slots. So just to make that very clear, right? Well, what is the problem that we're going to solve here? Is we have a number of lessons, math, chemistry, French, history. Those have all have a teacher. For example, math is taught by Alan Turing, chemistry by Marie Curie and so forth. And we have a number of, uh, we have student groups, uh, classes actually attending these, these uh, lessons. So for example, the math is, is given to the ninth grade and chemistry too. And so we have a number of uh, slots to put these uh, lessons into. So for example, the room A, 8.30 slot, right? The room B, 8.30 slot, or the room A, 9.30 slot, or the room B, 9.30 slot. You can see four lessons here, four slots. So what's going to happen is, um, we're going to give those to OptoPlanner, but before we do, we need to know there's a number of constraints, right? And uh, there's typically two types of constraints, hard constraints that need to be fulfilled and soft constraints that we want to fulfill. But let's start with some of the hard constraints here. So here, for example, math and chemistry, they share actually the same student group. They're both taught to the ninth grade. So those two lessons should not be happening at the same time. Because if they do, then students need to be at two places at the same time, which is, of course, physically impossible. Similarly, chemistry and French have the same teacher, Marie Curie. So they should not, again, be taught at the same time. So what we're going to do is we're going to give this problem to OptoPlanner, right? An AI constraint solver. You, you, there's others too, right? OptoPlanner is an open source one, uh, very popular in the Java ecosystem and the Kotlin ecosystem. And then we're going to give this, and then OptoPlanner will give us a solution and will tell us, yes, well, I'll figure it out. The best way to do this is to put math in room A at 8.30 and room B in uh, French in room B at 8.30 and so forth. Right. And you can see that uh, Marie Curie can actually attend both of her lessons, can actually teach both of her lessons. She doesn't have two lessons at the same time. And all of the students, the ninth grade and the 10th grade, can actually attend their lessons too. Right. Um, so you're probably wondering at this point, how hard can it be? Right? How hard? Well, it's pretty easy if you have to assign four lessons to four rooms. But yet, let's take a look at how many different ways you could actually assign those four lessons to those four rooms. Right. So here um, we have um, uh, we could actually take the first lesson, that math lesson, and assign it to uh, a room in four different ways. We could assign it to the first room, uh, the first slot, which is room A A30, the second slot, which is room B A30, or the third slot, which is room A but at 9:30, right? And which or the fourth slot, room B at at 9:30, right? And now for each of these possibilities, we could then assign the second lesson to each of these four possibilities again. So for example, we could assign history to again, the same slot as the math lesson, or we could assign it to the second slot, the third slot or the fourth slot. But of course, we could also start from where math is actually assigned to room B at 8.30. And again, we have four possibilities there, right? And, 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 and similarly for the other three. So at this point, we already have actually 16 possibilities to assign those two lessons into those four slots. Add in a third lesson, and uh, let's investigate specifically what happens if we put math and history at 8.30 in, in different rooms here. Um, then again, you have four possibilities. 
And, and uh, room A and room B might not be exactly the same, of course. They might be uh, a different uh, size and things like that. So th you can't just swap them around the, 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 the things between them. But anyway, four possibilities again per each of these combinations. We already had 16. That makes four times more possibilities. That's 64 possibilities. And see, here we can assign the chemistry the same as math to this, uh, the same as history to another and or to the, you know, slot three or slot four and so forth right and here you can see you actually try this one too now and then if you go further we can assign a fourth uh, lesson french in this case and you can see uh, that we have a solution here where we we're not assigning two rooms uh, two lessons in the same room at the same time but that's that's obviously a problem because we cannot have two lessons in the same room at the same time um the problem is at this point you might say okay uh Okay, we found the solution. How hard would it be? Well, the problem is that chemistry and French are actually taught both by uh, Marie Curie. So, um, sorry, but that's actually breaking a hard constraint. That is not a feasible solution. And in fact, this one over here is also non feasible because then history and French are actually taught by the same students. If you go, would go back to this, the previous slides, you would see that. Now, one of the actual feasible solutions, the one that I showed in, in the previous slide, is actually in, in one of these combinations over here. So, so, how many combinations are there? Well, if you have four states, right? Uh, if you have one lesson, um, we can assign it to four of those slots. If you have uh, two lessons, there are 16 different states, right? Uh, uh, if you have uh, three lessons, there are 64 different states. If you have four lessons, there's 260, uh, 256 different states. It's four to the power four. Why? Because there are four lessons, and and that's the power part. And then why base four? Because there's four slots to put these lessons in. Right. So what happens if you have 400 lessons? That's not even a big school 400 lessons, right? 40 lessons per uh, per group of students it means you only have 10 groups of students, right? That, that's not a big school yet. Well, for 400 lessons, that makes 400 to the power 400 different states. That's 10 to the power 10 of 10 to the power 1,040. That's a one with a thousand zeros behind it. Now you might argue. You don't have to look at all of these states. Like if you look at this, all of these states here below where you say, okay, we put history and math in the same room. We don't have to look at these. And you're through. And you could probably reduce the search pace by 99%. And I'm telling you, 99% is a rounding error. In this kind, in this kind of game, 99% improvement is a rounding error because you only reduce the search pace to 10 to the power 1038 in that case. So again, how, how big is this number of states? Just, just, just to uh, v uh, visualize it a little bit. So the search base for n lessons is n to the power n. For 400 lessons, it's 10 to the power 1040. Um, the number of atoms in the minimum observable, the minimum number of atoms in the observable universe is 10 to the power 80. So um, assigning those four lessons has more combinations than the minimum number of atoms in the observable universe. And actually not like a little bit more, more like uh, a Google times more, right? Um, you know, billions of billions of billions of billions of times more. So clearly, we need good, strong algorithms to get to go to, to go through these possible combinations and find us the best pos uh, you know the best solution we can in the available runtime we have, right? Given the CPU power we have, given the amount of time we have to actually calculate to find that solution. And for lesson scheduling, we're in luck. It takes, we have an entire night. But for other cases, we might just have one second. And that's, of course, where uh, our, engine, our well, planning engine are, uh, comes into play. Now, OK, lesson scheduling, it's a fun thing to play. There's lots of usages for uh, schools and so forth. But what about other, other sectors, right? Are there other kinds of planning problems? Um, well, there is. Well, so one, one uh, common planning problem is employee rostering, deciding which employee has to do which shift. So here, for example, we have a number of employees with different skills, as you can see. We have a number of shifts, like a morning shift, an afternoon shift, uh, a night shift. And we have to decide, OK, for this nurse gets this morning shift. This nurse gets this afternoon shift. And of course, there are constraints, like hard constraints, like you can only do one shift per day. Or if you want to do that particular shift, you need to rec you have to have the skill of a nurse, right? And you can imagine that in a hospital you have nurses and you have head nurses, or with security guards you have uh, security guards that can be armed or cannot be armed, and so you have different requirements uh, on the shifts, and you have to assign the right person to the right sh uh, shift. 
And of course, there are soft constraints, right? Uh, like, for example, there needs to be enough sleep between two shifts, so uh, they don't, uh, so the nurses can uh, actually, you know, do their job well. And also, the nurses or the employees might want to have a day off. For example, this particular employee says, "I don't like to work on Fridays," um, so um, we. Can that person asks for a day off request on Friday, and if possible, we will give that. It's not always possible. No, on typically on Christmas, nobody wants to work, and you will still have to assign employees. But most of the time, with optimizing this, we can give uh, the employees more times their day off uh, than uh, when they request it. Actually, about fifty percent we've seen in some data sets. Now, let's talk about another planning problem, and this is prop. Potentially, I, I did. I think this is the most interesting of all. It's the vehicle routing problem, in, in which we have to uh, send a number of vehicles to a number of locations across the country, and we we can decide which vehicle goes to which location, and also in which order they go to these locations. So for example, here you can see the green vehicle taking this route, the, going to these uh, these dots uh, to these locations, right? So, um, what are the constraints? Well, the constraints are your vehicles might be have a certain capacity, right? Um, in which how much they can carry if you're doing deliveries or if you're doing pickups. But if you're doing something else like sending technicians to, uh, for example, install internet or uh, you know do maintenance at, on uh, at at grid lines and things like that at electricity grids and so forth, um, then it is uh, then your your limit is not how much they can carry, but actually how many how much time they can actually spend on the road per day like eight hours on a day and then have to go back uh, because their day ends, right? And you could have time windows. You need to do certain jobs. Uh, you need to be at certain locations between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. And of course, we want to reduce the travel time, right? Um, so, um, and we actually did this. Uh, so we've, we've optimers used all across the world for vehicle routing. But one particular case stands out. I just want, especially given the, um, the sustainability uh, team of this, this conference. So, um, for one case, they, the the company, their management expected a 1% less driving time by using uh, vehicle routing uh, based up, uh, uh, when changing their old system with, with the new system based on, on uh, for example, OptoPlanner, right? And it was OptoPlanner in that case, right? So um, they actually got a 25% less driving time. Now, this was actually a case with tens of thousands of vehicles. So, um, and this is, you know, in production every year. And so every year now, they actually reduced their CO2 emissions by 10 million kilograms of CO2, but by more than 10 millions of kilograms of CO2 emissions per year. To give you an idea, that's the equivalent of in go, taking, an, take, uh, taking an airplane um, from Brussels to uh, New York and back 25 times per day. So it's every, so every single day, 25, uh, 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 you know, somebody flying 25 times back and forth. That's what what they what they save on a daily basis, and of course, uh, including weekends, including holidays, right? So it's uh, on a year basis. This is the amount that they save. It's 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 it's, it's quite insane. Um, I was very excited about that. They were quite excited about the other part of this uh, because of their productivity increase they got by this. They actually saved hundreds of millions of dollars per year. So. Um, in some in cases like vehicle routing, this can be extremely profitable. In cases like employee rostering, it's really good for service quality and employee uh, health and employee retention. Uh, but you won't see this kinds of uh, reductions uh, on this side. So it really depends on the planning problem and what you're optimizing on how how many reductions you can get, uh, and not how many, but what kind of reductions you get. And the world, there's, there's many more prowling problems, right? Like maintenance scheduling. You do, you need to do uh, maintenance on electricity grids or on railroads or on roads or on elevators or escalators and things like that. Uh, airplanes, right? Um, when and when and where those maintenance happens is something you can plan and you can plan that more optimally. Or agenda scheduling, assigning courts, uh, so hearings to courts and to magistrates to uh, optimize uh, the, the skills of the judges to, to where, which, uh, which hearings they get and so forth. Um, there's job shop scheduling, there's task assignment, and all of these are uh, planning problems. So the world is full of planning problems. And of course, OptoPlanner and open source AI solver, uh, constraint solver is one way to tackle these and uh, tackle these quite well, right? Um, I would argue, and at least from the data that I've seen, that it's, it's, it's the best in, in the world, right? But um, like I said, we're going to implement uh, this application and we're going to do that using Quarkus. So it's time to talk about Quarkus. So what is Quarkus? Quarkus, and, and so we could, we could implement 
uh, this implement, uh, Opto Planner, we can use that on Quarkus, but we could also use it, for example, on Spring, which is an alternative there. And Opto Planner supports both. But today we're going to focus on Quarkus because I want to show you some of the you know unique benefits of Quarkus, which is a sup supersonic, subatomic Java platform. Um, you might think that's a little bit of marketing speech. I'm I'm hoping I can show you that it's it's more than just marketing. It's really it is really supersonic. Uh, and of course, you can use this in Kotlin too. And uh, we actually have an, an example using it in Kotlin too in, in, in with Opto Planner, right? So um, how does how what are we going to what are we going to build? Well, we're going to take the Quarkus platform, right? We're going to expose a REST service. Um, we're going to uh, take the uh, uh, a, a browser will go to that REST service and send back and forth JSON files. And we're going to put those JSON files in, an, in an, with Hibernate in a relational database. So it's it's very traditional. And of course, you can pick and choose. You can replace any of these components with more uh, you know, modern things like you would say if you want a NoSQL database or anything like that. Uh, but I'm going to stick to the, the, the boring stuff that just works well, right? Um, and um, uh, which works well enough for the scale I'm, I'm, I'm running at it right now. So um, how do you get started with a project like this? Well, you go to code.quarkus.io and that will generate your POM file or your Gradle build file, right? So let me just show you that. I'm going to go to um, code.quarkus.io. You can see this is code.quarkus.io. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, okay, um, I would like to use Hibernate, let's say, right? Uh, with Panache, I typically use. things you can do with it. And then you click the blue button to generate your application. You get a POM file and you get, get, can get started, right? And you can fill in some of the other information too. So um, that's how you would uh, generate the application. So let me show you what, um, so I've actually started the application. Uh, uh, I've written a part of it already, um, just because of time limits, of course. There's no AI in this, this yet. So what I've already written is um, I've already have a domain model. I have some persistence to go to the database, to the relational database. Uh, I have some test data that I'll be showing in a minute. And I have a REST service that exposes this and then a, a, bit, a bit of uh, plain JavaScript to show that. So let me, sh let me actually show you uh, that running first so you can actually see that. So I'm going to actually start the Quarkus application. I'm going to use Quarkus Dev for that. I'll talk about that in a minute. But let me just start it up. So Quarkus dev is development mode of Quarkus. That means when I make changes in my code, Quarkus will immediately reflect that in the uh, application. So um, here we go. Um, this is starting now. Um, so if I switch uh, to uh, the, there's a warn because I, I have added OptoPlanner, but I have not written any OptoPlanner code yet. That will go away as we start adding code. Uh, OptoPlanner started, uh, Quarkus is started here. And uh, this is a dev mode, so this takes quite long. It takes three full seconds, That uh, right? Uh, maybe also with Zoom running here. And anyway, um, let me just jump to uh, the, the uh, application here. So, so this is localhost. When I re refresh, I have the application here. You can see I have a number of time slots here, number of rooms, and number of lessons. Uh, so that's what the application that I've already uh, written. And when we click the green button, well, that code is not implemented, so we'll get an error, right? And if we actually go back to the code here, you'll see the error show up here. And that's because I have an unsupported operation exception that I throw when we act on the timetable resource on that rest resource we call the solve method. As we'll see here, uh, I've just thrown an exception there, right? So, um, now let's take a look at uh, what's behind this code and uh, let's go through that, right? And then we'll, let's start making some changes and see how Quarkus Dev uh, can, easy, can immediately show the effect of those changes to us. So domain-wise, we have, um, as we, if you remember, we have to assign these lessons to these time slots, to these rooms and these time slots, right? So domain-wise, we have uh, a time slot class which has a day of week. I'm using java.time here, of course. So day of week is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so forth. I have a start time and an end time. So for example, the start time is 9.30, 9 the end time is 10.30. 
And then I also have a room class, which has a string. So, so I have um, in the test data you saw, I had 10 time slots. I had three rooms, right? Room A, room B, room B and uh, C and so forth. And then of course I have lessons, right? So a lesson might be a math lesson, right? So the, the subject is then math or French or chemistry or, and so forth. I have a teacher like uh, Marie Curie and so forth. In here, in this case, I've used teacher just as a string, but of course, in a more elaborate application, you would actually make a teacher class and just say, my lesson has a reference to a teacher, right? And then I have a student group, which is uh, basically a group of students that have the same curriculum. And so for example, the ninth grade or the 10th grade that are following this particular lesson, right? And uh, then of course, each lesson uh, needs to be assigned to a time slot and a room. And that's where we're going to use the AI to make that do that for us, right? In, in, in the most optimal uh, manner possible. So um, let's take a look behind and how this looks like code-wise. So in the code, um, that's that error we just had a second ago. Um, and I am going to leave Maven Quark as dev running, right? During the, during the entire demonstra uh, during the entire uh, uh, presentation. So here we have the room class. And so I have a room which has an at entity annotation, which means this room is also in the, the database, right? This means that there is a table called room in the database and that uh, we will there we will persist the data. Um, the room has a name uh, as a string I've, I've explained earlier as like room A, room B and so forth. And it also has an uh, ID, which is the database ID. Each of all of the things that go into database also need a uh, database ID. And I've actually, you know, told Hibernate JPA that this is the, uh, the the ID, so it knows that, and I want it to be generated by the database. I don't want to have to figure out how to create my own unique IDs. To let the database do that for me. Besides that, we just have some constructors, some getters, some setters, and a two string method to make it a bit pretty. But um, all of those things are not really that needed. So um, time slot, time slot class, uh, same principle. It has an ID, um, it goes in the database. The ID is generated by the database. It has that day of week thing, which is of course java.time, right? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so forth. And then the start and an end time, right? 8.30 and 9.30. Notice there's no date in here why we're assigning for part, uh, one week and we copy paste that to every week in the future. In other planning problems, you would actually assign not to a day of week, but to, to a particular date. But um, for lesson scheduling, uh, we just, we, we, we optimize the template to use for every week. Um, and then of course, lesson. Uh, the lesson class again goes in the database, again has an ID, uh, has the subject, the teacher and the student group as explained earlier, and then has that reference to a time slot and to a room. And um, that's actually when this lesson will be taught in which room. And these are many to one relationships, which means that uh, OptaPlanner, uh, so that Hibernate will make sure there's a foreign key in the database that goes from the lesson table to the time slot table and that it works well, right? So um, at this point in time, uh, you're probably wondering, so how do we write and read the lessons from the database? Well, um, there's a really interesting, uh, useful class for that, and that's do, do in Quarkus, and that's called uh, a Panache repository class. So what this will do, what this class is, is basically says, okay, I, I'm a lesson, lesson repository, and I can read and write lesson classes. So if you actually ask here, um, if you actually ask here, uh, what, uh, what can you do with a, a Panache repository? You can find lessons, you can list lessons, you can persist and, and so forth. And Quarkus will make sure that, um, you know, this entire class is, is correctly implemented and op, uh, um, when, when you want to use it. And where do we want to use it? Well, we need to generate dem demo data, right? So in the demo gener uh, generator class here, what I'm going to do is, um, what we do here is we actually generate the data dot. So for example, like room A, room B, room C, which you saw, if you remember, if we go back a second and we go over here, we saw room A, room B, room C. This actually, this data actually comes from this, uh, from, from this DEMA generator, right? So what does it do? It says, okay, um, I'm application scope. That means there's only one instance of me, right? And uh, it gets the repos those repositories injected. And then it creates, for example, like in here, it creates a list of rooms. It fills in those uh, room A, B, and C, and then it calls room repository persist that room list. So it basically says, here are all my rooms, put them in the database, please. And when does it do that? It, do that, it does that during a startup event, right? Uh, it does that transactionally, of course, but more importantly, it does this during a startup event. So every time Quarker starts up, 
it runs this code. And the question is, how often does Quark start up? And then let's get let's see what happens when we change this code. So let's see, for example, that we want to say, I want to create a, uh, a room called uh, DevOx Ukraine, right? DevOx Ukraine, right? And um, if I now go to the UI, so if I just go to, uh, oh, wrong button. If I actually now just go to the UI and I, let me just do F11 here, you can see it's still room C, right? If I click refresh, it is actually now uh, room DevOps Ukraine. So what happened and how fast, how long did that take us for that change to appear here? So let's talk about that for a second. And um, that's really, the Quark is dev mode, right? So everybody talks about Quark is about, you know, you can compile natively and that's all fine. And that's great for serverless uh, running, uh, for running your your uh, your application serverless in a serverless environment. And it will save you, um, you know, a, a ton of, uh, um, you know, money basically because you will run, uh, you, you will need far less uh, computing resources in that kind of cases. But most cases are not, you know, not all cases you run serverless, right? The, the thing that for me, the big the big benefit of, of Quark is, is, is the Quark's dev mode. That's the one that I'm, I'm really excited about. And that's the one I'll be showing today. And I, I won't go into the, the serverless uh, bar, uh, benefits today. So what really happens, right? So when we start Quark's dev, um, it will, uh, it, it says create drop the schema, right? Because it's in developer mode. So it will actually, uh, because we turn that on in the application properties. And what basically means is that the, the relational database, I'm using an H2 in memory database at this point in time, that the schema are in, in the, the tables and so forth will be set exactly the same as my domain classes, as my entity classes. And then I'm going to insert the test data. So when a little bit later that uh, first request comes in, um, it just executes the SQL queries to say, okay, give me all of your uh, les lessons, give me all of your rooms and so forth. And it shows that to the user. Let me, let me quickly show you where that's happening. That's actually happening in the time in that rest class that I uh, spoke about earlier. So when the UI wants to show a list of all of the, uh, uh, lessons and all of the rooms and all of the, uh, the time slots, we're actually sending it a timetable. So that's that fourth domain class that I haven't talked about yet. Let me just quickly explain that. It's for quite simple. It's a timetable which has a list of all time slots, a list of all rooms, and a list of all lessons. And that's the JSON object that we're sending from the server to the client to actually render there. And uh, that contains all of the information. And so um, this get timetable method, this is a, a, a get method. Um, and uh, this is using JuxRS, but you can actually use Spring uh, Web Annotations in, in Quarkus too, if you prefer that style. But this is a JuxRS style. And um, what it does in the transactional method, it's going to create a new timetable by going to the repository and saying, give me all of your time slots, give me all of your rooms, and give me all of your lessons. It's going to sort them on what we write here. We can actually change that sorting right now if you want to. And then it will, uh, and, and, and this will return it. Notice for one second that this is calling, this method is being called here, and this has a transactional annotation. And even though it's in the same instance, it actually works. This is actually guaranteed to be, this actually is running in a transactional context. Uh, uh, we will not find that in all platforms to be. Uh, so, um, that's what happens when I call the guest method and get methods. It creates a timetable by, by actually querying for all of the lessons and all of and so forth. But as you saw, I changed that room. So what happens when I change that room? So let's, let's do that again. Just 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 to click here. Okay. So let's just say DevOps with some exclamation marks. I go back to the UI over here. I hit refresh and it actually shows those changes, right? So what happens in that case? Well, in that case, um, you have changed, I've just changed some form of the source files in the ID and Quarkus dev actually detects that, oh, you've changed one of the source files. So what it done does is um, it's not a hot deploy. It, it actually a complete restart of the Quarkus application. Right. And so um, what it does is it sees that when the when in the browser we click that refresh button, that get comes in, it figures out, okay, some of the source files changed. It doesn't do that in the background, it waits until the, the get method comes in. So because you can be making a lot of changes and only when you're done with your changes and you want to see those the, the result of those changes, then it, you will refresh your UI. And that's when uh, Quark has noticed like, oh, 
some of the files changes, I cannot just do the SQL queries and be done with it because the code has changed. I need to, you know, the code is the code that I compiled is out of date. So what it actually does is it restarts the entire server, does the drop uh, and and does the drop create again of the schema, does the insert of the test data again, does the and then then, then does the SQL queries that the whole point of for the get method returns that, and all of that together typically takes less than a second. So let's let's. Let's try it out once. Uh, let's actually show that. So in here, you can see how long it took. Um, yeah, with Zoom running, and this is a 2015 old uh, desktop, um, it does take more than a second. Normally, uh, it only takes one, one second. So this is how long the live reload takes. And I can actually, actually can trigger a live reload from here by cl clicking the S button. So let me do that. I'm triggering a live reload, and you can see it takes less than a second, 887 seconds. Let's do that again. Uh, okay, let's restart three, three, four times. And of course, this crashes, crashes. This doesn't go out of memory. It doesn't suffer from all the problems that hot deploy suffers from, right? It just works. And um, again, if we change, let's change this back to just room C as it should be. Let's go back to over here. Let's click refresh again. And you will see this becomes room C. So uh, that's Quark is dev for you. Uh, very quickly changes, right? Now, we were going to do AI. So let's talk about AI planning optimization, right? So um, we're going to add OptoPlanner in the mix. It's already in the POM, but there's no OptoPlanner code in, in there yet. So uh, what we're now going to do is the first thing we need to do, we need to do three things for OptoPlanner. We need to tell them, okay, what's the changes on domain? What can you change OptoPlanner? We need to tell them what are the constraints are, and then we need to hook it in the, the, the solve and the solving, we need to hook that in, into our code. So the first thing is the domain. So um, what changes during planning? Well, it's actually quite simple. It's the time slot and the room that changes during planning. OptoPlanner cannot decide to give lessons a new teacher or you know, a different student group or change the subject of some of the lessons. It cannot, right? Um, the only thing it can do is it can decide for each of the lessons, which are the time slots and which are the room. That's where we can find OptoPlanner to make changes. And because those things change, we need to add a planning variable annotation on those uh, properties, either on the fields or on the getters. And such so that OptoPlanner knows I can change those. And then any class which has one or more of these planning variables is called the planning entity class and needs a planning entity class annotation. So what OptoPlanner will do is, well, we will give OptoPlanner those 20 lessons or 400 lessons with all of the time slots and room fields NULL, right, before solving. And after solving, uh, this can take a few seconds. This can take, we can run it for minutes or hours even if you want to. And then OptoPlanner will uh, give us a solution where all of the um, uh, lessons are assigned to a time slot and to a room where they're non-null, of course, right? So let's start making those code changes with a little bit of live coding, which is always fun. So uh, in our lesson class, like I've said, this is going to change during planning. So this is a planning entity because it has one or more things that actually change during planning. Oh, not a planning variable, uh, planning entity, right? And then it's the time slot class that actually changes during planning. So I'm going to say, okay, this is a planning variable and uh, the, uh, now I need to tell them where is my list of time slots to, to pick from because I, you know, OptoPlanner cannot invent time slots for us, right? So I'm going to say there's a there's something called a time slot range. I'll, I'll in a minute, I'll, I'll, I'll hook those up. And it can pick from any of those to fill in for the time slot for each of those, you know, 20 lessons, 400 lessons, right? Similarly, it can also, it also needs to assign a room. So we're going to do the same thing there. We're just going to say, okay, there's, I need to assign um, each lesson to a room too. Okay, now I said, where is this list of uh, time slots and where is this li list of rooms? And that's, and that's actually, well, Remember our timetable that actually has a list of all of the time slots and all of the rooms. And we also need, need something to give to OptoPlanner to solve. We cannot just give him one lesson and solve that because it needs to assign all of the lessons together because they influence each other, right? You cannot assign one at a time. So um, that's the time slot that we're going to give to OptoPlanner. And after he's uh, OptoPlanner solved that, it's going to give us back and that's the solution. So we need to assign this, we need to annotate this with a planning solution annotation, which basically means this is the thing that we're, this is the wrapper we're giving to OptoPanner that contains all of the stuff we wanted to do. And of course we need to tell them, okay, which lessons can you assign? So we need to tell them, okay, you can find those lessons in here. This is your planning entity collection, uh, which basically means this is a list of all of your lessons that we want to assign from null to, to assigned. And then of course, uh, like I said earlier, we still need to we, need, we still need to tell them okay, 
which time slots can I pick from? Why is that time slot range? Which rooms can I pick from? And of course, that's this these two lists over here. So we need to say, okay, this is our value range. And we, we're providing a value range. And we're saying, okay, this is our time slot range, right? And similarly, for rooms, this is also a value range. And this is the uh, room range. So now OptoPlanner knows, okay, for each of those lessons, I can pick from this list of time slots for a time slot and this list of rooms for a room. Now, when OptoPlanner actually is solves a time slot table like this it will actually grade it it will score it how good the solution is for every solution it encounters and um a, a typical solution is a hard and soft a typical score is a hard and soft score so uh and we can actually we want that information we want to know that we want to be able to show that in the ui so i'm going to add uh, a field for that the hard soft score field and i'm going to add a planning uh, score annotation so the player knows this is the score field now, um, we also want to send that score field uh, to the client. And because we're using Jackson here, I need to add a getter at the end here for that new score field that we've just created, right? And, and that's about it. Um, the Jackson binding and so forth is all done through Quarkus uh, extension, so it's all good. So now we've modified the, the domain. We can now actually give OptoPlanner this, this timetable uh, it can then solve it and give it back to us. But um, what are the constraints? We need constraints, right? So um, let's create a, a package called solver. All right. And let's create a constraints in a set of constraints in there. I'll call them my constraint provider. And I'll, and I will implement a constraint provider here. So constraint provider, here we go. And what this does is it actually it actually it has a single method define constraints, and here we're going to return an empty list of constraints. We're going to say um, there are no constraints for now, right? And so uh, Quarkus will pick this up and will uh, plug this in too. And so that's the second part. And remember, we needed a third part. And the third part is this: when when you when we click that green button, we go to this unsupported operation exception, which was that, that stack trace we got in the beginning. Well, we need this to actually solve the thing instead of uh, throwing an exception, right? So what we're going to do here is we're going to say, okay, so we're going to implement this here. So the first thing we need is we need something that can solve problems for us. Like, like, and when you use JPA, you have Entity Manager, which can solve, which can put things in the database for you. Well, in, in OptoPlanner, you have a, a solver manager. So you have a solver manager and that's where we're actually going to uh, inject that of course and it's a solver manager to solve timetables for us and we also need to give it um, um, everything we have it solve we need to give that an id and so i'm going to use the type long here you can use use uid and string too that's basically if you have multiple data sets to solve if you would be solving multiple school timetables in parallel, you want them to have a, each unique uh, uh, job ID, and that's basically the job ID. And so um, that's our solver manager, right? And then Quarkus will provide us for us based upon all of the other information we gave it. So now when uh, the solve method is called, what we'll do is we'll do solver manager, please solve, not just solve, and but also listen. So what is listen? Listen means that every time OptoPlanner finds a new best solution, we want to be able to see that in the UI immediately. We don't want to batch wait until it's done solving. Every time it finds a better solution, we want to see the latest best solution in the UI. And that's why we do solve and listen. And in the solve and listen, we need to give three things. First of all, we need to give this uh this 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 is a job id and so i'm just going to hard code the job id to one l so one long right and because we only have one data set but if you have multiple tenants multiple data sets each job would be a separate id there and then we need to have a read and a write method now the good thing is we all have the load timetable method here so um this is a method that this is a a function that gets a problem id and then returns uh the uh the timetable, right? So uh, given this one L, which will come from here, it will load the timetable. And uh, then uh, that that's how it reads the, the problem to solve. And every time it finds a new best solution, it needs to save it. And luckily we have a save method over here, a transactional save method that just takes the timetable and makes sure that the changes of the time slot in the room are actually persistent in the database. So we're going to call that here. We're going to say, okay, 
given a solution, please save that uh, uh, with that save method, right? So uh, let's see what happens if we run this. Um, let's go back to the UI. Let's refresh that. Um, Quarkus hooks everything up, no errors, that's good. All is fun in the live coding if that happens. And now let's click that solve button and see what starts happening. Well, OptoPlanner actually now solved. It assigned all of the lessons into the first room, into the first time slot. Why is that? Well, um, well, it's solved, our model is fine. It actually it knows how to assign the room and the time slot. Um, the solve method clearly called, but um, remember the constraints were empty, right? If you go back to over here and we have to go to our constraint provider, we said there are no constraints. You can do whatever you want. Clearly, uh, we don't want it to do whatever it wants. We, want, we don't want it to put two lessons in the same room at the same time. So we need to add that constraint, right? Let's talk about that. So. Like I said, there's two types of constraints, hard constraints and soft constraints. Clearly not having two lessons in the same room at the same time is a hard constraint. So you could add it like this. You could say, and an OptoPlanner supports this actually, where you say, okay, um, I have, uh, I wanna go through all, I wanna have that room conflict constraints. I'm going to go through all of my lessons. I'm going to go through all of my other lessons and then check if those two lessons have the same time slot and the same room then that's a bad thing. That's a hard constraint broken. I'm going to tell OptoPlanner stop doing that. And I'm going to count how many times it actually puts two lessons in the same room at the same time. And uh, I'm going to basically hit OptoPlanner on the head when that happens. What's the problem with this? There's a problem with this. It's not incremental. It's, it's, it doesn't scale well. Um, when the room of the math lesson changes and this code is run again, this code will check again if French and chemistry are in the same room. But when you change the math lesson from room A to room B, then if French and chemistry were in the same room at the same time, then that's still going to be the case. And if they weren't, that's still going to be not the case, right? So that's very inefficient, right? Um, and furthermore, it doesn't use hashing. So there's actually two big uh, scalability problems with this code. And therefore, uh, we generate. We actually uh, developed a, uh, a streams-like API, an SQL-like API, that is uh, that does actually have all of those benefits without you having to write the delta and uh, calculations to actually make that happen. So um, let's let's use that 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 API to add the room conflict uh, constraint. So what do we do? Is we say, okay, I want to have uh, a new constraint, and uh, I want to. Uh, for the room conflicts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just like SQL say, give me all of the lessons. All right, here we go. Oh, give me all of the lessons. And then join me with all of the other lessons, with all of the lessons basically again. So then we have a pair of any two lessons. And when that happens, I want to penalize it as a room conflict. So I want to tell OptoPlanner, don't do this. Penalize, bad OptoPlanner, stop doing that. And uh, it's a hard constraint. So I'm going to say, I'm going to penalize that as one heart, right? And you can even weight that and so forth. Uh, of course, it's not just any two lessons. The lessons actually have to be in the same room at the same time. So what are we going to do on top of that? We're going to say, okay, join, but I want some join conditions and I want those. Uh, and you can do this with a filter method, but I'm actually going to use uh, equals here where I say, okay, when the lesson gets a room, is actually the same and the uh, lesson get time slot is the same, then uh, we're going to penalize it. So now when we have two lessons, the first lesson selected and the second, second le lesson selected, which are in the same room in the same time slot, we're going to get a room conflict. Now behind the scenes, OptoPlanner uh, does this, like I said, incrementally with delta calculations, but it also uses um, uh, indexing techniques to actually make sure that these joins happen efficiently, right? The same th techniques that da uh, databases use. So, uh, but the only the difference is, of course, this is a method. So you, so you can return whatever you want in that method. You can you can you can actually you know make this uh, you know a lambda and so forth, and that would all work fine too. So anyway, let's take a look at what the results is when you actually execute this. So we click the green button. Uh, the lessons get assigned. This might look good, right? We see we have biology assigned to 830. We don't have any, we have, you know, every lesson is in their own room. Not a problem here. But 
Uh, remember, we don't just have to figure out the room constraints because that would be pretty easy. A human could do that very easily. We also have to figure out for the teachers. And oh, that looks like, oh, look over here. French and uh, physics of Marie Curie, same room, uh, same time, right? Not the same room, but the same time. Uh, so basically, Marie Curie has to be at two places at the same time. And even further, if you look at it per student group, you can see that some of the students, like the 10th grade, also have to have, have two, uh, two lessons at the same time. So clearly, this is not a feasible schedule. This is, there are still hard constraints broken. We simply haven't implemented them yet. So let's do that. Let's add uh, one for the teacher, a teacher conflict. And let's add one for the uh, student group. Student, student group conflict. Um, and um, I'm going to just duplicate this code right now in the interest of time, right? So I'm going to say, okay, we have a teacher conflict and we have a student group conflict. So in the teacher conflict, we're going to call that teacher conflict. We're going to call this one student group conflict. In the teacher conflict, when we have a lesson and we join that with another lesson, so now we have a pair of lessons and, oh, not the same room, but the same teacher, right? And they have the same teacher and they are at the same time. You know, two lessons can have the same teacher as long as they're not at the same time. But if they're the same teacher at the same time, OptoPlanner, stop doing that, right? For the student group, um, if we have two lessons which have the same student group, um, are happening at the same time. Again, we're asking two students, students to be at two places at the same time. We don't want that. We're going to tell OptoPlanner, stop doing that. So let's take a look. Quark is dev still running. We just refresh. We click the solve button and we immediately see the results of our changes in code quite beautifully. Again, uh, in, in, in mere seconds. So um, by room, we still have everything fine. Let's take a look at our teacher. Now, okay, this is actually a feasible schedule for the teachers. We don't, we're not asking people to be in two places at the same time. And the same for the students. This is a feasible schedule. Is it a good schedule? Mm, not really. If you look at it per teacher, you can still see gaps in it. And you, you want a more compact schedule for teacher, right? You would love to have one, a teacher would love to come just Monday to school from, and no gaps between the lessons. So uh, they, you know, they, they, they maximize their, uh, they minimize their commute and they, and they maximize their efficiency when coming to school. And so uh, that's a soft constraint we could easily add. Unfortunately, we've run out of time for today. But in, if you actually want to try this out, if you actually want to add that, uh, if you want to see how that works at soft constraints, we have an example for that. So what do you do if you want to see that? You go to get started. You go to um, optoplanner.org, the website, and there's a link there to the quick starts. And this is the quick starts you'll find them in this GitHub repository. And uh, you just clone them and you go into the school time tabling quick start, and there you run Maven Quark as dev, and you'll actually see it where it actually takes into account those soft constraints too. And you can start playing with those soft constraints and changing them. And um, the interesting thing is that you'll see that in most cases, uh, in most planning problems, many of the constraints uh, are similar, you know, if one vehicle routing problem versus another has the same, uh, has 80% has of the same constraints. But there's also always 20% of the constraints that are company specific, organization specific. And there, there's not an option to leave them out. The, the solution is completely useless if you leave, leave them out. And that's where, why, you know, you need to be able to add your own custom constraints very easily. And that's what you can do with OptoPlanner quite clearly. Now we have more than just this quick start of school timetabling. We have uh, maybe 10 quick starts with Quarkus. Uh, we have a whole bunch of old quick starts with, with, with Swing, 20 or so. Um, we have a, a Spring one, we have a Kotlin one, we have an ActiveMQ one. To, so if you want to look at, if you want to you know, start playing with this to take a look at OptoPlanner quick starts. Now, let's take a look if there's any questions. And um, if you want more information about these projects, uh, do go to uh, optoplanner.org and quarkus.io and uh, start playing with them and take a look at the guides and, and try them out. It's, it's really worth it. So yeah, thank you, Geoffrey. Actually, I invite you to continue your discussion about soft constraints in the Q&A session. So guys, if you want to hear more or if you have any questions about what Geoffrey has presented, just join the Q&A session and continue live discussion. So thank you once again for supporting the Vox Ukraine this year. And yeah, I hope to see you in Ukraine next year in person. Me too, I hope. Thank you. Thank you.